Praise the Lord. Finally, brothers and sisters, yeah, rejoice, strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Since finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Let's pray. Our Father, we give you praise and glory. We honor you. We thank you. We ask that today your word will come forth in the power of the Holy Spirit and that your word will bless your people as they come. I'm just a vessel. Let it be your words that come through me. In Jesus' name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Well, I'm quite excited about the theme you've chosen for the year. It's the theme of restoration. And already, you've, I believe you've had two sermons on the subject. So, we probably have an idea of what restoration is, but I probably want to talk about restoration again just to emphasize what it really means. It means the act of returning something to its former state. That's what we are called to do. So I know people who have a passion to restore paintings, antique paintings. There are people who love to restore old vehicles. I have friends in Accra who, who are restorers. And the whole idea of that restoration is to try and bring it back into a certain state that it was in. Because over the years, it probably has lost some of its qualities. So the idea is to try and take it back to the state it was in. So in this passage, the appeal is for the hearers to strive for full restoration. To strive for full restoration. And I like to preach contextually. Because scriptures must be preached in their context. Otherwise, you may lose the meaning. Now, this is Paul writing to the church of Corinth. This is his second letter to them. And, you know, uh, he's about ending the letter. And he's telling them that they need to strive for full restoration. Now, what was this letter about? Usually, Paul, Paul's letters are what you call pastoral letters. He's writing to a church. In some of the letters, he's just writing maybe a letter to the book of Philippians, writing to exhort and encourage them or teach them something or to address a problem in the church. So if you look at the letter to the Corinthians, in the first and second Corinthians, Paul was writing because there were problems in the church. There were issues that had arisen and he wanted to address them. So for example, some of the things that Paul was dealing with, if you, if you look at second Corinthians chapter 3, he was talking about the fact that there, was, there were divisions in the church. There were lots of factions. Some people said, well, I, I follow Paul. Others say, I follow Apollos. You know, others say, you know, I, I'm after, I'm, uh, this is my favorite pastor. I'm going after him. The church also had issues of sexual sin. It was known for sexual sin because there were people in the church, there was someone in the church who was having an affair with his, his, his stepmother. And that was something Paul was also addressing. There was also the issue of gifts. There was disorder in the church because when it came to spiritual gifts some people would pray in tongues they would not have any regard for others so there was a lot of disorder when people came for communion some would want to eat more than others so there was uh, issues in the church so the whole essence of the letter was to try and find ways in which they could deal with those problems and when you read the book of Corinthians Paul addresses each and every one of those problems as to how they can overcome these issues. Now, at the end of the letter, as he ends, after providing the solutions, he tells them that strive for full restoration. He's saying that I've provided the, 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 the oh, what's the word? I've provided the means by which you can resolve all the issues I've addressed. But I want you to strive for full restoration. Now, before I go into that, if we were the church of Corinth or the church of Elim, and if the Lord were to write a letter to this church, what would be some of the issues that he may be addressing? And those are issues in our individual lives. And in this season of restoration, my topic is more about spiritual restoration. Maybe the next time I, can, I come, we may talk about something else. But my, the question is, if the Lord were to write a letter to Elim Church, what would be the issues? There will be the individual issues each and every one of us is facing. So, I'm going to tell you that it's, it's important to look at your life. 
and ask the question, what does the Lord want to restore in my life as well? But what does it mean to strive for full restoration? Now, let me go back to the point I made that Paul provided solutions to them as to how to deal with all the sexual sin, what they needed to do. But then in, at the end, he says, strive for full restoration. And what does that mean? I believe that striving for full restoration, the, the, what Paul meant can be found in the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Can you please put that up on the screen? Romans 8, 29. This for me is the picture of full restoration. Now it says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now, like I said, he dealt with the issues that they had to deal with, but he says, strive for full restoration. And what does full restoration look like? It means looking like Jesus. Amen. That is what the whole essence of full restoration means. Full restoration isn't simply about what, we, what our needs and so on are. This is the picture that Paul is painting. That He wants us to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn amongst many brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters, we are all siblings of Jesus. By virtue of the fact that we've been saved and translated from the domain of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God's dear son. He says, to them who received him, to them he gave them the power to become sons of God. So it means that we are now family with Jesus. Amen. Amen hey, no, is not very encouraging. Oh, you want me to tell you you'll be restored financially before your amen is louder? He says, so that is the whole concept, that we should begin to look like Jesus. Amen. We should begin to pick up the characteristics of Jesus and begin to look to that. That is what he's saying, that we should begin to look at that and begin to seek to be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. So what is the process of restoration? I believe that the process starts with deciding where we are first and foremost. To be restored, restorers make an honest evaluation of whatever they are restoring. If you want to restore an old car, you need to look at the car carefully because there may be rust, there may be dents, there may be all kinds of things that you can't see. So you need to spend time to make an honest evaluation of what you want to restore. So what does it mean? We need to be honest about where we are, you and I. Before we think about being restored, we need to be honest. You make an honest evaluation of yourself. At times, we tend to be in denial about where we are. You know, we have issues in our lives that don't look like Jesus. But we want to justify them. Perhaps we, 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 we have certain character traits which we know are not good. But we justify it and say, well, you know, well, it's okay. Everybody's like that. I'm not too bad, you know. Because even when Paul began to, to talk to the Corinthian church about their problems, a number of people rejected Paul. They said, well, who are you to come and tell us about our, our problems? It's because they were in denial. So to start the process of restoration, you've got to be honest. You've got to start with honesty. You need to do what I call a self-evaluation. In, in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, it says, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. So you've got to start with honest self-examination. If you want to look like Jesus, you've got to start and ask yourself, where are the areas in my life that need restoration? Now, that's going to be an individual question for each and every one of you. But there are some few areas that I want to talk about today that we can start working towards if we want to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Because that is the ultimate, brothers and sisters. Because... That is what God is looking for. People conformed to the image of his son. So what are some of the areas that we should secure full restoration in? The first one I want to talk about is to recognize the priority of God's kingdom. To recognize the priority of God's kingdom. In Matthew 6.33, it says, We should seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all other things will be added unto us. Amen. So the question you need to ask yourself this morning, what has priority in your life? What has priority? Is it your business? Is it your family? Is it your ministry? You've got to ask yourself, what 
has priority. Because we need to be restored to the place where God has priority. God has the first place in our lives. Because if we don't, we will have problems. Now, if you look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, in John 6.38, can you please put that up for me? John 6.38. He says, for I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Amen. That is number one. For a Christian, we've got to evaluate and seek to be restored to the place where the will of God is paramount. Amen. That the will of God, oh, today I'm preaching to a very quiet church. <laughs> that the will of God is paramount. That is the priority. You know, in Haggai chapter 1 from verse 1 to 11, can we just look at that? Haggai 1 from verse 1 to verse 11. It says, in the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you, yourself, to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. He says, think about what? Your ways, the ways in which you are living. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but have ne have, never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought. Second time, the Lord is saying, think carefully about your ways. Let's go. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord, because of my house, which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of, the, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew, and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people, on livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Amen. Amen. Now that paints a clear picture for us. Now the Lord is telling them that. They were busy building their own houses, trying to establish themselves, yet his own house lay in ruins. The Lord is saying that I withheld the blessing because you were so busy, concerned about yourselves and not about my business. You know, it's like that. We come to church, we, you know, we're busy. We say we, we love the Lord and so on. But if you were to check what has priority in your heart, it may not be the Lord. It may be some other thing. And today in the season of restoration, God is saying that you've got to give me priority. Amen. I've got to have first place if you want to be conformed to the image of Christ. Because Jesus says, I came from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. He had no ad agenda, but the agenda of the Father. You know, when you look at the life of King David, King David, one of the reasons why God blessed David was because David, David was a man after God's own heart. David said, how can I be living in my palace whilst the Ark of the Covenant has no place? And he wanted to build a temple for the Lord. But the Lord says, because your hands have seen so much blood through your walls, it will be your son that will build that temple. David was more concerned about the Lord. So that is the first thing you must seek to be restored to. The place of giving priority to the Lord's, the Lord's business. Now let me say something to you. We talk about being blessed financially. We talk about being blessed, you know, our businesses will prosper. Let me say something. There are Christian kingdom principles that bring a blessing. There are principles that bring a blessing. Now, we are in very hard times. This year was forecasted as that the world is going to go into serious recession. Already Ghana's economy itself is in a very problematic place. So the question that you're going to ask is, how are you going to navigate these extremely difficult times? How? I mean, you can plan, you can try and forecast. Some of you may be good economists, you may try and make a projection. But I can tell you, all those projections can be thrown out of gear in no time. Because we are in uncharted waters economically. 
But let me say to you, biblical principles never fail. That in these times, <laughs> praise the Lord, for once I have a response from people. Biblical principles never fail. For those who in this season will put kingdom priority first, God will take care of them. Yeah. I can assure you, if you choose to listen to what I'm saying, I'll come back at the end of this year and you'll be the first to tell me that we put kingdom first and God proved himself faithful. There are no other formulas. I'm not an economist. I can't give you a seven-year developmental plan. I can't do that for you. But I can tell you that if you would, even in your business, ask God, God, how can I give priority to your kingdom? What can I do with my business, whether in my giving or anything else, that would give you priority. And you're not doing it because you want to do it to get something. But because Jesus says that I came from heaven not to do my own will. Our agenda is to do the will of God in our business, in our ministry, in whatever area. That is the priority. So that's the first area if, as we seek restoration. That the will of God would have priority in our lives. The second thing I want to talk about is to restore your devotional life. To restore your devotional life. It is great to come for congregational worship. We can meet here on a Sunday, have great fun, come for prayer meetings. But each and every one of us must seek to restore your devotional lives. For a lot of us, our devotion is what I call fast-track devotion. We wake up, read a few passages, read a, a, a bit in our devotional, and we're on the road. We are gone. By 12 o'clock, if I asked you what you read, you probably can't even remember. It's because we're in a hurry. But we are called to a place of spending quality time with God. Your Christian life can, is only as good as your devotional life. Amen. Let's look at Mark chapter 1 verse 35. Mark 1. It says, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Amen. Now, this is Jesus, the Son of God, anointed, but he found time for a devotional life. Now, I'm not saying that you need to wake up very early every morning. Everybody has the times that work for them, but you've got to make quality time to spend with the Lord. And that quality time means spending time in your Bible, spending time in prayer, spending time to get to know the Lord. Now, those are not only the times for requests. There are times of intimacy. There are times of going behind the veil and hearing the Lord, spending time, meditating on his word. You've got to build your Christian life. Our Christian lives cannot be built simply by coming to church. You've got to spend the time. This is an investment you have to make. To grow spiritually doesn't, you, you know, people may lay hands on your head, you can go home, but nothing will change. You have to find your own relationship with the Lord. You've got to be able to speak of your own encounter with God. You can read books, you can read people's accounts in the Bible, but you've got to have your own encounter with God. Amen. Amen. That's what I'm going to challenge you today. Be restored to a devotional life where you get to seek the Lord in the word and in prayer. Become a person of much prayer. Seek the Lord's face. Make time. Listen to, look at the life of the Apostle Paul. I mean, if there's anybody who should be very content with what he achieved, he wrote almost three quarters of the New Testament. I mean, the Apostle Paul was used by God to, to raise the dead. I mean, he, he, he was used by God in setting up a lot of churches. But one thing he kept saying was that, that I may know him, that I may know him. That was the cry of his heart, that I may know the Lord and the power of his resurrection. Let's ask ourselves, has that been the cry of your heart? Ask yourself, you know, I know we are, we are encumbered with a lot of our own personal needs. But you know, God will meet your needs the next time you have another need. The needs will keep coming. I mean, they're insatiable needs. But the key thing is that beyond needs, let me ask you, if God didn't even meet your needs, would you still worship him? You know, there are some people who give up. They'll say, well, you know, I pray to the Lord. I asked him to give me this. He didn't give it to me. I'm fed up. I'm off. We are not Christians simply because God has to meet all of our needs. Listen, I often tell people that a lot of people don't, I often tell people that when we get to heaven one day, I believe that there are going to be 
setting tables in heaven. I, I don't have biblical support for this, so I mean, I feel that if the Apostle Paul and others are sitting on a table, these are men who gave everything for the gospel. They gave their lives. They are people who died for the gospel. They are people who gave, lost all, families, all of that. And when you compare your Christianity, where all you did was to keep crying, Lord, give me this. Lord, give me that. Lord, I want this. No baby Christian is supposed to go and sit on that table. We need to mature. Amen. It is time to grow up. It's time to move beyond there. So be restored. The next one I want to talk about is to be restored in your personal ministry. Now, each of us, we come to church on a Sunday. You find people like you and uh, people like I, Pastor Gabby, Pastor Lucy, preaching to you. That is our ministry. Each and every one of you has a specific calling. Some of you were probably serving before, but you probably not serving like before because either, you know, you, you, something else has caught your attention or you're upset with somebody, that's why you stop serving. But you need to find your personal ministry and fulfill it. There's a scripture in the Bible, Paul tells Archippus, he says, Archippus, give heed to the ministry that you were called to and fulfill it. Why? Because our ministry must connect to the Great Commission. The reason why you are a Christian is that you are called also to bring others to Christ. We are called, most of us are not involved in the Great Commission. We are supposed to preach the gospel and make disciples of people. But it gets to a point where we come to church, we are very comfortable, we forget about it, we are not that interested. But in Matthew 28, the injunction to us is to go and make disciples of the nations. That is the call. That each and every one of us will have an opportunity to tell someone about Jesus Christ, bring them into the kingdom, and help them to be dis discipled. And so this year, if you're looking to be restored, be restored to the ministry to which God has called you. I believe that each and every one of us has been called to do something for the kingdom. And this year, in this year where we're going to face economic challenges, we're going to face many trials, focus on doing your ministry. Even if you're in a time when your business is not doing well, you say, God, is there anything I can do in the meantime? Can I give myself to something? Can I go somewhere to pray? Can I go to Pastor Gabby and ask that, is there something you want to pray for? You can become an intercessor. Decide to pray for people you know who do not know Jesus. Make a list of 20 people. You say, okay, these friends of mine don't know the Lord. I'm going to intercede for them. Quietly, you keep praying for them. Find your ministry. Jesus came. When Jesus came, he says, I've come Okay, in, in Luke 19, 10, he says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus was very clear about his mission. He says, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. So in this year, find and be restored to your place of ministry. Some of you were serving before, but I think you've decided, well, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not that, you know, interested anymore. This is the time to be restored to your ministry. For those of you who are not serving at all, this is the time to find that ministry and begin to serve. Amen. Amen. Quite a number of things. I want to try and close. Now, this is also the time for restoration of broken relationships. Time of restoration for broken relationships. You know, in uh, the book of Corinthians, there was a lot of divisions. Paul says there were lots of quarreling amongst you. You know, some people were fighting, you know, fighting each other. This is the time to seek healing in our relationships. Now, we have very, some of us have, we have strange relationships, relationships that are not working. Maybe spousal, maybe with relatives, with brothers, sisters, whatever. And they may be people who are difficult to deal with. But God is calling for us to make the effort to unite with people. Now, you make the effort. If they choose not to respond, that is not your responsibility. You make the effort to try and restore your relationships. Maybe we've been badly hurt by people. Maybe as you're sitting here, some people have betrayed you, they've caused you a lot of pain. I'm not saying that just get up today and immediately go and say, listen, I want to be restored to you. Make it a decision. Begin to pray about it and say, God, open the door for healing. Open the door for restoration that I may be able to see this relationship healed. Now, it may not happen immediately, but tell the Lord, that you want me to have healed relationships. Let's look at Romans 12, 18. That's an important 
scripture. Romans 12, 18. Romans 12, 18. He says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with what? With everyone. Yeah. You know. I have some fractured relationships myself. So I've got to work on that. I'm not preaching something to you that I've surmounted. I've got to work on some fractured relationships. So all of us must begin to seek the Lord and say, Lord, where can I be at peace with this particular person? Give me the grace that I may be able to do that. Amen. The next thing I want us to talk about is, is to be restored to personal holiness and purity. We need to seek to be restored to holy living and personal purity. You know, in the church in Corinth, there was someone who was in a relationship with his stepmother and Paul spoke against it. You know, these days, the whole issue of holiness seems to have been something that we don't seem to give much attention to. But God is calling us to the place of holiness because we're supposed to be reflecting him. We're supposed to be reflecting him in our lifestyle and in our character. So God says, be holy as I'm holy. Now, we may never attain sinless perfection on this side of eternity. I'm not going to, that's a fact. None of us on this side of eternity will attain sinless perfection. But what we need to do is to consistently seek to die to the flesh. We need to be restored to the place of love. You know, in 1 Corinthians 13, when Paul was t talking about the issues in the church, he, in 13, he talks about the importance of love. You see, 1 Corinthians 13 is a sandwich between 12 and 14. 1 Corinthians 13 is sandwiched between 12 and 14. 12 deals with spiritual gifts. 14 also deals with spiritual gifts. But in 13, he talks about love. So love is important. That no matter what we do, whether we are serving, we're, we're seeking to walk in holiness, we're doing all of that. If all of that is not undergirded by love, it's a waste. Because the Lord says, I can, if I speak in tongues, do all the things, but I have no love. I'm like a clanging symbol. So we want to pray that God will restore us to the place where our love is manifest. That we can love people deeply. We can have love that reflects the character of Christ. And as I reflect on love, there are many people who struggle to love. And it's not really their fault. Because they didn't experience love when they were growing up. There are many people who have a lot of psychological problems because... They were abused. They, they never knew what the love of a parent or love of a friend was. So it's hard for them to give love. But love is so key to our Christian walk. So I believe that the Lord is saying to us that no matter what trauma you've been through, no matter what pain you've been through, I have placed my love in your heart. He says the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. That's in Romans 5. So the love of God is that what it needs to, what we need is the activation of that love. So we're going to ask the Lord to help us so that we can begin to walk in these things that we're talking about. So I've listed a couple of areas for restoration that we need to look at. I've talked extensively about being restored to the place of your ministry, God having priority, being restored to the place of, okay, uh, broken relationships, personal holiness, love. So how do we get to do this? And I want us to look at how that can happen. It says, strive to obtain full restoration. Strive. Now, the striving means that there must be some effort on our part. Striving means that we must be intentional, that we must be committed to the process. When you say strive, it means that make every effort that you've got to do. So the first thing we need to do is to become intentional about restoration. I mean, when you leave here, it's either you may get the the cast, the tape, the, the recording. It almost reveals how old I am. I grew up in an age where we had cassettes. How many of you know what an eight track is? Oh, thank God, I'm in good company. I'm not alone. <laughs> so how many of you don't know what an eight track is? Can you raise your hands? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so we need to be intentional about restoration. We've got to be intentional. It isn't just something you hear in church, oh, we'll be restored, we'll be restored. 
you've got to make a decision. You've got to be intentional. The first thing I told you was to be honest about where you are. You've got to be intentional. Strive. The second thing is the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Excuse me. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. You may be as well intentioned as you are. You may be sincere in your heart to see change. But in your own strength, it, may, it will not work. Because like I said, the flesh stands in the way. Let us draw on the power of the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit of God lives in us. He has come to empower us. Let us draw on the power of the Holy Spirit. If you pray in the Holy Spirit, you build yourself up. Rely on the Spirit of the Lord to help you. Third, I want to go back to the devotional life again. Even though I said be restored to your devotional life. Your devotional life holds the key to your restoration. The times you spend with God, the times in His presence, the times in being honest. And I'm just saying, when you get into God's presence, do what I call honest prayers. Tell God where your struggle is. Speak to Him and ask Him for help. As we build up in our devotional lives, we will find that the strength of the Lord will continue to help us. Finally, remember, restoration is not an event. It's a process. It may sound like this is, we want to be restored this year. No, it's a long-term process. It's a journey you begin and you stay on the journey. You know, there are going to be times when you will fail in the process. You may fall back into sin. You may go back to some of the things you're not supposed to be doing. But please don't give up. Please don't give up. Keep your eyes on the goal. Keep your eyes on the goal and say, you know what? I fell. I'm going to seek the Lord's forgiveness. But it shouldn't become a license. But go back with sincerity and say, I'm going to complete this. I'm going to stay. I'm going to go on the journey until I'm restored. So I've come to encourage you this morning that strive for full restoration. I want that to be that which guides you in terms of your spiritual work this year. That God will begin to do a new thing in your lives. And at the end of 2023, we can look back and we can say that we have grown spiritually. Amen. Yeah, we praise the Lord. I want to thank Him. Can we just have our eyes closed for a minute? I want us to spend some time to pray. You've been listening to this, what I've said. You've heard me preach this word. I want you to talk to the Lord this morning. Whatever you've heard. I believe that everybody has a part of the message that ministers to them. Maybe God has spoken to you in one particular area. It could be in your ministry. It could be in your holiness. It could be in giving priority to God's kingdom. I want you to talk to the Lord this morning. I want you to tell him, Lord, you want to ask for his grace. You want to ask for his strength. You want to ask for his help. That in this year, your spiritual life would find supernatural restoration that you climb higher than you've ever done before some of us are struggling in some areas today you want to talk to the Lord and say Lord set me on that journey of restoration Tell me that you want this to be a year in which your walk with him takes on a new dimension totally. Tell him that you want to pursue him like David says, as the deer panted for the water, so my soul panted after you. Tell him that, Lord, I want this to be a year in which I hunger and I thirst for you like I've never done before. You know, you want to set the scene for the year. This is the, the time to say, Lord, I want to be restored. I want to pursue you like I've never done before. I want to seek you. I want to find my place in my calling. I want to find my place in my destiny. I want to walk in holiness. I want the grace of God to manifest in my life. That should be the cry of your heart. You want to say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. You know, the things that matter are the things of eternal value. All the cars, all the houses, all the clothes, all those things will have no meaning in eternity. In eternity, what will count is the lives we live for the Lord. We want to be conformed to the image of Jesus. We want to look like him. 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 The story is told of a man who went deep into the jungle and he met some boys and he was trying to evangelize to them and telling them about Jesus. 
about what Jesus did, that Jesus' character is love for people. And the boy said, that sounds like a man back in our village because the people could see Christ in him. We're not there yet. We're still a work in progress. I'm not there yet. I wish I was further along. But let's trust God today and say, Lord, help us that we may walk in that restoration, walk in the place of being changed unto one degree of glory to another. Praise the Lord. morning before I take my seat, I just feel like praying for people who are not well, anybody who has a health challenge. I just want to pray for you. I just lift up your hands. I just want to pray that the Lord will minister healing to you. Father, I pray for those ones whose hands are up. I pray that the healing power of God will touch them. We speak healing into their bodies. We rebuke every sickness. We rebuke every disease. We ask that the hand of the Lord will minister to you, that you'll be made whole, you'll be made well, that you'll be recovered fully in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray.